Welcome to the Wade Center's podcast. A podcast of Wheaton College. Welcome to the Wade Center podcast. I am joined today by a fantastic group of people, one of which happens to be my husband, Dr. David Downing, my co-director at the Wade, and our wonderful producer, Aaron Hill, but also we have the great opportunity to have a conversation with Dr. Mark Knoll, perhaps one of the most famous Christian historians um, living today. He has a PhD in the history of Christianity from Vanderbilt University, and he taught at Wheaton College for 27 years before going on to Notre Dame. He has published around, I, I kind of don't do numbers well, but it's around 25 books plus more co-edited volumes. But the one that most people recognize is the 1994 Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. I got my first tenure-track job at a Christian college not long after Dr. Noel published Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, and everybody was talking about it. They so appreciated uh, Mark's dedication to understand certain elements of anti-intellectualism among evangelicals. Another book that I have quoted in several of my books is called The Civil War as a Theological Crisis, where Mark did this research about attitudes towards slavery among both Southern Christians and Northern Christians, and how Northern Christians as well were thinking that the abolition of slavery was unbiblical. And it really forces us to think through how different eras of Christians foreground different issues. And that is exactly what is exciting about the book we are going to discuss today. But first, just to impress you a little bit more, in 2006, Dr. Knoll was awarded the National Humanities Medal in the White House. Wow. So, I know. So, David, he why... He jumped on a hand grenade and saved someone's life. <laughs> he <laughs> saved get a medal all of humanity. humanity. That's right. <laughs> so, Dr. Knoll, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's a real delight to talk with you. I've enjoyed visiting the Wade Center for decades and was certainly delighted to take part as the Hanson Lecturer two years ago. David, why don't you explain the origin of this book, which is called C.S. Lewis in America. And it is basically dealing with the reception of Lewis among different groups of Americans. People see the title and they'll think that C.S. Lewis came to America. <laughs> yeah. uh, our associate director, Marjorie Mead was overhearing a, a tour once that someone was giving, and they said, well, C.S. Lewis came to the Wade Center, and he said, yes, that <laughs> is my ward. That's my wardrobe. And Marjorie pulled him aside and said, he never came to America. He never came to the Wade Center. And the person said, well, thanks, and went back talking about C.S. Lewis at the Wade. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, I know. Uh, sometimes... Can you imagine if we discovered evidence that he secretly came to America? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah right. But, but that's uh, it, precisely why we need historians like that, Mark That's why Noll. we need Mark, yes. Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, the Hanson Lectures were initiated about 10 years ago. Uh, the idea was to have a distinguished scholar talk about one of our seven authors from the point of view of their discipline, and then have three respondents from elsewhere on campus to talk about the initial series of lectures from their point of view and from their discipline. And then these are every spring now, about once every month, January, February, March, and then they're collected into a book. So this book is based upon the Ken and Jean Hansen lectures. They were friends of Marion Wade, worked with Service Master, and their Ken's son, Walter Hansen, and his wife, Darlene, set up this uh, speaking series in honor of their parents. Mm -hmm. So it's been very successful. It really gets a lot of people talking about issues that might normally not be together. It's great for the community, and it gives us a chance to showcase some of our really brilliant minds at Wheaton, mm. such as uh, Dr. Noel. Tell us how you decided to approach the three different lectures that you would be delivering to the public and then would be put in this book. The origin of the project came about when Chris Mitchell, your predecessor as the director of the Wade Center, asked me to prepare a paper for 2013 and the 50th anniversary commemoration of 
C.S. Lewis's death. I'd had many uh, conversations with Chris when I was at uh, the college at Wheaton, and many times I, I expressed a slight hesitation. I thought, well, focus on C.S. Lewis is great, but is it possible that adoration of Lewis is overcoming the chance to actually learn from Lewis? So mm-hmm. what, what he said then, well, why don't you do a paper relating to some aspect of C.S. Lewis history? My wife, Maggie, was at the time, I was at Notre Dame. She was employed as my teaching assistant part-time, and we tried to research the early reception of C.S. Lewis in America. We set on the period 1935, when the first American Review appeared, and 1947, when Lewis appeared on the cover of Time magazine. Mm -hmm. Maggie had actually done uh, research going on, but the number of reviews and the amount of commentary on Lewis just began to explode, particularly we come to 1950 and the Narnia tales. So it, it made a nice... 12-year period, to look at the early American responses, C.S. Lewis. And then what came from the research itself was a a natural division. Um, Mm. Catholics were the first to seriously engage with C.S. Lewis. Once the Screwtape Letters were published in America in February of 1943, there was a tremendous boom of interest all throughout the United States. There was a little bit among academics before, but nothing like what came later. And then Later on, evangelicals, ex-fundamentalists, also began to read and comment comment on Lewis. And and I thought, well, where do they fit with the other Protestants? So it it became a kind of natural thing to look at the really strong quantity of material produced by Catholics on Lewis. Then what was the general reception from first academics to Lewis's uh, scholarly writings, and then to the general public, and then more particularly to, to Protestants. And there could have been other ways of, of dividing this up, but this worked out quite well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, what I love about it is you're not just learning about the way people thought about individual books by Lewis. And you have a great chart at the beginning of your book that shows what of Lewis's work was published when, first in England and then in America. But also it is such an insight to the attitudes different Christians groups had to each other. And especially, as you point out, after the war, there's just such, especially among fundagelicals, a suspicion of Roman Catholicism. And, you know, Lewis died in the middle of Vatican II, which really revolutionized and opened up a lot of thinking among Roman Catholics. So, What struck you in this first section about the Roman Catholic response? Were you surprised or did it just make sense to you? Yes, I I was surprised and surprised by both the quantity and the quality of reactions, reviews of of C.S. Lewis. The quantity was interesting because there were Catholic authors writing about Lewis in Catholic periodicals, and then there were a, a significant handful of Catholic authors writing about Lewis in publications like the New York Times, the New York Herald Tribune book review. The first or first or second uh, Lewis review by a Roman Catholic was by Thomas Merton mm-hmm. in the years between his uh, reception to the Catholic Church and when he entered the monastery in Kentucky that he lived in the rest of his life. And Merton did this review for the New York Times, I think it was 1938, of the book that Lewis had put together with Tilliard debating uh-huh. how literary criticism should work. Should it focus on the literary artist, or should it focus on what the artist was trying to portray? Mm-hmm. And Lewis, of course, was defending focus on what the artist portrayed. Merton wrote quite a uh, good literary view, but then also made a kind of theological statement about the heresy of making the artist more important than what the artist right. was doing. And I thought that was interesting because it anticipated much that came later with Lewis's defense of objective morality and objective moral instinct. Well, that was early, but then uh, right away after the publication of the, particularly the Screw Tape Letters and then the Ransom or, or Space Trilogy, there was a lot of serious literary criticism by Priest in America, which was a Jesuit magazine, Commonweal, a magazine organized by lay Catholics, journals out of Fordham University, journals out of Marquette University. So there, there was just uh, a great deal of interest and overwhelmingly positive. There were a few Catholic reservations, particularly because Lewis, in his presentation of the Christian faith, did not stress the activity and the place 
the central place of the church. The other reservation is, is a little bit comic looking back because some Catholic reviewers, particularly in the conservative side of the Catholic Church, were not so much nervous about Lewis, but they thought that other Catholics were too enthusiastic about books that had not been canonically mm. approved oh. by, by some kind of authority. Mm. And then the, really the, the, the most striking thing was that the deepest, most serious, most learned writing about Lewis in America of any kind until the late 1940s came from Catholic articles writing during World War II. Mm. A man named Charles Brady, who was an English yeah. professor at Canisius College in Buffalo, a Jesuit school, published a two-part article in America Magazine, May and June 1944, that was the most extensive, deepest, best-rounded attention to C.S. Lewis in the United States of the period. There would not be anything like it until a few years later, Chad Walsh, the English professor from Beloit began to publish on Lewis and eventually did, did a, a full mm, book. Mm. Brady's articles uh, touched on Lewis's scholarship on Milton and Paradise Lost, touched on Lewis's scholarship on Edmund Spencer and the, the medieval uh, ro uh, romance. He, he wove discussion of the Ransom Trilogy into what he had to say about the screw tape letters. He understood what Lewis was trying to do in the pamphlets published as broadcast talks. And he did this in about, uh, I think, three or 4,000 words. And we were really pleased in the publication of the book that America Magazine allowed us to reprint th those two articles. They, mm. they, were, they really were just the best and roundest commentary. Brady sent these articles to C.S. Lewis. He wrote back and said, you're the first critic who has, who has done my entire oeuvre, them, all mm. my works, the way sh they should be done. Right. What struck me as I read this section is just the brilliance and how well educated these Catholic reviewers were. And it put me in awe, as well as the fact of the, throughout your book, Paralandra had um, a very positive response for people, as well as Pilgrim's Regress. Now, People don't understand Pilgrim's Regress at all. We, the Wade had to do an annotated uh, <laughs> Pilgrim's Regress to explain everything. And in fact, my colleague here on the podcast did the an annotated Pilgrim's Regress. But also, my colleague here, David Downing, um, was going through a real cr faith crisis in college, and it was Paralandra that brought him back. Why don't you explain why? And that might help explain why Paralandra spoke to so many Christians of all different denominations. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, Mark mentions Elizabeth Elliot loved Paralander as a yes. college student at Wheaton. Mm -hmm. She's reading Paralander. For me, it was uh, the idea of using science fiction or fantasy as a vehicle for serious reflection on theological ideas. The whole idea that Satan fell because he wanted to be in control and he wanted uh, Ransom has to explain to the green lady who's the eve of that planet. She doesn't know sin. And he says, what if you went to get one kind of fruit and you found a different kind of fruit? Would you take what was given to you or would you keep looking for the one that you wanted? And she says, no, you should always take what Melildil provides for you. And he says, well, what if somebody just insisted on going for what they wanted rather than what was given to them? And he turns this into a whole theological discussion of Satan fell because he wanted to have control over his life. Yeah, and one of the statements, Mark, that you make in this section really resonated with me when you say that Catholicism was never as repressive, priest-ridden, monochrome, or oriented towards salvation by works as Protestants regularly complained. And I'm, I'm a baby boomer, and so I was in that generation that had suspicion of Roman Catholics and, in fact, made an unfortunate, flippant comment in our last podcast about the Immaculate Conception, which I rendered incorrectly because I was taught incorrectly that it's just that, oh, even Mary was born of a virgin, which isn't the case. The Immaculate Conception is at the moment of Mary's conception, or she starts growing in the womb, she didn't carry original sin. That is what's meant. Mm. And so this chapter made me realize how I had been bred with a problematic prejudice. Mm. What, what struck me, they always say reviews often reveal more about the reviewer than the, the item under review. And as I was looking at your three chapters, 
the Catholics are going, well, Lewis is good, but he could be a little bit more Catholic. <laughs> and uh, the, the uh, uh, reformed, well, he's good, but he could be more reformed. He's yeah. more of a total depravity than yeah. the fundamentalist. Uh, it is interesting how much, I don't know if they realize it or not, how much they're yeah. reflecting their own. Why don't you think like I do? Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, what I found interesting about the first chapter, Mark, was how you you set the, give a context for the Catholic Church in America and how it was very isolated uh, and the focus was on the uh, the priesthood and the, the laity were not empowered at all, and how that was one of the reasons why Lewis resonated with them so much. Can you talk about that a little bit? I thought sure, that was really sure. fascinating the, insight. Um, yes, the, the the Catholic response came from lay people. Um, I think it was Brady who said this is the most effective public apologist for Christianity since G.K. Chesterton. All but right. but the commentary also came from a number of priests, and most of them were, were really pleased with Lewis because they saw in the imaginative works particularly, mm. but then also in the broadcast talks, which beginning to come out as pamphlets, they saw a clear statement of what would later be called mere Christianity. And and it, with reference to what Crystal said about the, the isolation, you, you, you have the sense that there is a, a lay and clerical faction, part of the Catholic Church that is, that is in effect, pointing toward the Second Vatican Council mm. and looking mm. forward to a time when contributions from the laity, contributions from Protestants, contributions from those who aren't in the Catholic Church can be gathered in. Mm. The one thing that I think is necessary to be said about the response to Lewis is that in the relative isolation of American Catholics, there, there was, however, a vigorous intellectual life. It was, it was philosophical. Yes. I should probably pause to say that a number of the Catholic reviewers really appreciated Lewis's appeal to a universal natural instinct of moral objectivity, mm. which in their eyes looked a lot like the natural theology line going way back mm. to, to, yeah. to Thomas Aquinas. But the schools and universities that had been set up by Catholics in the United States really did have a high level, maintain a very high level of classical learning so you had someone like Charles Brady, a master's degree student, not a PhD student, but yet who had himself mastered classical, medieval, early modern, modern literature, and could bring all that information to bear in, in talking about C.S. Lewis. There were a few Protestants who could do that, and a few people in the general public, but not too many. Mm. 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 I like your description of uh, the parishioner's duties in the Catholic Church mid-century where to Pay, pray, and obey. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was a great yeah. summary of their obligations. Yeah, yeah. Um, your respondent to this section was Dr. Karen Johnson. Why don't you tell us one thing you appreciated about her response or you learned from her response? Yes, I'm really delighted that Karen Johnson could provide the, the commentary on the Catholic lecture and for one very specific reason. Karen's own scholarship deals in large part with the Catholic response to race in the 20th century mm -hmm. United States, particularly the World War II era and after. And one of the leading Catholics that she studied in a very fine book on Chicago Catholics and racial matters in this mid-century period, one of the Catholic leaders she fe features is a priest named Father John Lafarge, who was actually a, a leader in, in among the clerics in moving the, the church toward a mo more we would say today, more advanced position on uh, civil rights. Mm. It turns out that Lafarge was also a reviewer of one of, or two of C.S. Lewis's books. <laughs> yeah, cool. and, and actually, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't Lafarge, but others uh, found in Lewis's treatment, particularly of the different species he created for, I'm not sure if it was all of the, uh, uh, the, the, the Ransom, Ransom Trilogy, but the, the, at least Paralandra and Out of the Sight and Planet, um, one of the Catholic uh, commentators talked about Lewis as subordinating racial difference. And Karen was able to talk a great deal ab about how uh, Catholics at the mid-century and moving toward the present were just inching toward a more Christian practice uh, of civil rights. So it was, it was really great to have her yes. with this knowledge of the mm. Lafarge and then really interesting that he was one of the reviewers of, of C.S. Lewis yeah. as well. Mm. I've read Alice on the Planet at least 25 times. And it's never occurred to me that Ransom's first encounter with the Harasa, he's like a giant otter, he's six feet tall or like a right. stoat. And this reviewer said maybe that was an image of right. racial right. encounter, or racial, mm. uh, I don't know if I'd say uh, tension, but wow. I, I thought yeah. it was just a uh, 
he's meeting another uh, rational soul. Yeah. So here's someone who could speak and have critical judgment, moral judgment. But I'd never thought about it in racial terms. Yeah. But Lewis Actually, responded rather. Uh, Lewis was very interesting in response because he yeah. said, "I hadn't thought of that either." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, yes, but but he says, and this goes back to the personal heresy that you were talking about earlier, Mark. That it's about the work itself, okay. and many times the work speaks things that you're not even aware. And mm. especially as a Christian, you might think the Holy Spirit is speaking through right, you. Right even apart from your sense of control. It's about the art object itself rather than deifying the artist. Well, and as Dave was saying about the different Catholics, you know, wanted Lewis to be more Catholic and Mm. Protestants wanted to be more Protestant. um, Perhaps that revealed something about that reviewer in the state of race relations in America in the middle of the century, that they didn't view blacks as fully human. Yeah. Mm. Mm. You know? Mm. You know, in Richard Hofstetter's book on anti-intellectualism in American life, one whole chapter is on evangelicalism. And I'm wondering if there just aren't as many uh, fundamentalist or evangelicals writing in the 30s and 40s. They have so many uh, thought journals or opinion journals. Uh, It was interesting for me reading your book to understand where does common wheel coming from? Where's thought coming from? Mm -hmm. Often you just get these uh, articles from one of these journals Mm. and you have no context. Why was it founded? What was their mission statement? So I enjoyed uh, seeing what the the context was for many of these writers Mm. and many of these articles. Yeah. Mm. I enjoyed the second chapter, if maybe we want to talk about that for a second, uh, or the second lecture, uh, just from the perspective of Lewis as a literary scholar and these secular people receiving him before he achieved the you know, level of fame that he has today. And, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia sort of shifts the perspective for mm-hmm. pretty much everybody, even non-Christians, and they sort of see him through that Christian author lens. But them treating him as an academic, I thought was very fascinating the way you covered that. So you want to talk about that a little sure. bit? Sure. It was interesting that most of the American coverage of Lewis up to the publication of the Screw Tape Letters did deal with his uh, more academic works, his preface to Paradise Lost, Uh, David will have to fill me in the exact title, but the the study of late medieval romance, uh, Edmund Spencer. Allegory of Love. Allegory of Love. Um, And there was review as uh, more than just uh, Thomas Burton review of the Tilliard debate on personal heresy. The first time I read personal heresy, it's supposed to be a spirited debate, and they were both. Right. Tilliard was more established than Lewis. Right. But my impression on reading that exchange of essays, they go back and forth, and yeah. it's like a duel between someone with a rapier and someone with a butter knife. Uh, <laughs> Lewis just seems so much more adept and uh, clear in his thinking than, than Tilliard, but that yeah. was, that's my opinion. The, 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 the academic treatment was interesting because some of it came from well-known people. Roland Bainton, who would later become well-known for the 1950 biography of, of uh, Martin Luther, commended uh, The Allegory of Love. Arthur Lovejoy, at one time in U.S. history, well well known for his studies in intellectual history, the founder of the Journal of Intellectual History, cited Lewis and, uh, again, several of his academic works. The appreciation was both literary and ideological. As Lewis's point in the preface to Paradise Lost, which I was pleased to read in preparation of these, these lectures, was that there's a lot you can say about Milton, but if you neglect theology, you've neglected the heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. And Milton scholars in the U.S. said that basically that's right. There was a little bit of resentment by well-known American Milton scholars that Lewis didn't quote them. (laughs) (laughs) Imagine that. But but, uh, almost universally, they they either thought the book was pretty good or real good. And it was Mm -hmm. the same with Allegory of Love. Mm. Um, Lewis actually had correspondence with uh, two or three first-rate American academics before there were, there were reviews, but these academics, Paul Elmer Moore was one, um, I'm forgetting the names of the other, but, but they had passed from the scene by the time um, the more popular works came. Mm. But yes, he, he, he was uh, well-regarded and significantly with um, a few reviewers like Charles Brady, Victor Hamm from Marquette University, eventually uh, Chad Walsh, uh, the more serious reviewers knew that what was coming from Lewis by way of imaginative writing, the great divorce, mm. screw tape letters was deeply rooted in that profound knowledge of, of uh, medieval, early modern classical literature. Mm. Paul Elmer Moore, uh, Lewis called in one letter. He said, called him my spiritual uncle. 
Uh, he normally was mm. pretty suspicious of Americans and American scholarship. Although in another letter he says, I like American reviewers. They seem to actually read the book before they write the review. <laughs> <laughs> so well, didn't, he learned to appreciate uh, Americans. Didn't some of your professors in grad school at UCLA require Lewis works? They did. His scholarship is very respected. I've read Personal Heresy, mm-hmm. UCLA, uh, Allegory of Love, Discarded Image. It shows a whole level of Lewis. People think of him as a popular mm-hmm. children's writer or lay theologian. When you see him as a scholar, there's a whole extra uh, dimension to his mind that's really impressive and I would say also daunting. Mm. What also made me realize how things have changed is that both the Chicago Tribune and the New York Times reviewed and praised Pilgrim's Regress, Mm -hmm. which is basically a, it's like Pilgrim's Progress. It's about a story about coming to faith. Now that was 1944. And that you can get this type of intelligent, uh, critical thinking about Christianity. And now discourse has become so polarized that people can't discuss in critical language in uh, popular Although I have I mentioned UCLA. I have a UCLA story. We were reading Milton, Paradise Lost, and the professor said, well, Milton's something of a heretic. He was an Athanasian, and that's really... And I said, no, Athanasius was the, the Athanasian Creed. That's Orthodox. It was, Ar- you're probably thinking of Arius. Yeah. And my professor said, oh, you just say that because you're a Christian. <laughs> and this is before Wikipedia. If I did it now, I'd yeah. say, look it up on Wikipedia. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it was a strange kind of ad hominem. I'm defending Milton because I'm a Christian rather yeah. than mm-hmm. had he made a mistake. Well, and this chapter reminded me of my experience of grad school wasn't until um, the 1980s, but... Um, many of the responses to Lewis were um, somewhat snobbish, that he's so retrograde, and this goes back to the modernist emphasis on progressivism. We're moving beyond the need to believe in old-fashioned Christianity. And even in the 1980s, I would have I had one student, my fellow student in grad school, uh, say to me, you're the only Christian I've ever met who's the least bit intelligent. <laughs> and then a professor of religion who, when after some famous speaker talked and there was this wine and cheese reception and um, it, people were just kind of snobbishly discounting anybody who's a theist who believes in God. And I go, well, I believe in God. And this, I still remember this professor of religion swirling his Chardonnay and then saying, my, aren't you an anachronism? <laughs> you know, the, in the 80s, mm. you can't be intelligent and be a Christian at the yeah. same time. So when I was reading some of the responses then in this section, it just, re- that lasted a long time. If anything, it got worse. Yeah. Well, it is, it is interesting that there was a little bit of uh, condescension to Lewis. Uh, and actually, it shows up most in Protestant, mainline Protestant periodicals, but, but there's not really much of that. Um, in, ge- in the general press, there were some reviewers who critiqued different parts of Lewis's writing and, and actually some academic writing in the uh, mid-40s that actually rejected him entirely. But he was always treated with respect because mm-hmm. people realized that he was uh, smart and that he, he could, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, he had, he was basing what he said on solid research. And um, in non-Christian publications, I think there probably was a general sense that this is really good work. Mm-hmm. Lewis actually appeared on a cover of an American magazine before time Oh. He was on the cover of the Saturday Review, Saturday Review of Literature, in either 1943 or 1944. Huh. And the, the author of the article that accompanied the cover photo, or co- cover Im- image, was a very distinguished uh, literary critic himself who was not so much taken with Lewis's Christianity, but was very impressed with his myth-making uh, qualities. Mm. And he realized that the Christianity was essential to it. And it didn't seem to bother him at all. Mm. I like the phrase about someone saying Lewis was a word juggler and a paradox monger. Uh, that was a clever phrase. I think it actually applies more to Chesterton than Lewis. But yeah, I, that's yeah. true. But um, to reinforce what Mark is saying is that even people who disagreed with Lewis's 
Orthodox Christianity still recognized the quality, as you said, not only of his scholarship, but of his prose. And that's something many readers of Lewis today, is, it, it, they don't talk enough about his prose, the quality yeah. of his, the art itself. Well, and I also found it fascinating. One of the things I found fascinating from this second chapter, uh, Mark, was where you mentioned about how the uh, theosophists responded to him. Mm-hmm. And so you, you mentioned a couple of the reviews from the Theosophical Review and how that connected to Barfield and right, Anthroposophy. Right. And it just made me, it stood out to me because we do have a Theosophical Society right, right, right here in Wheaton right, that I drive right. by uh, right. all the time. And it stood out to me that they just sort of were like, oh, this is great. This is this is exactly what we believe, just the words are slightly different. Oh. <laughs> and I, I found that very fascinating because of all the sort of different audiences that are out there, they right, right. they just just immediately they're like, oh, this is great stuff. No, you know, no notes. Uh, we're, we, you know, we want to use it as is. Well, and, you know, uh, Mormons and Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Christians both love Lewis. Yeah. But they both have a way of drawing out of Lewis what they consider yeah. to be some mm-hmm. of their core doctrines. Yeah, so I just thought that was fascinating, this, this ability to almost read your own beliefs into some of right. Lewis's writings that seems to be going on at this time. I think that's happened in, with the Bible itself occasionally. Right. Right. So yes. Anytime <laughs> someone is occasionally. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anytime that you have a revered text, people start more and yeah. more seeing themselves. Right. It becomes right. a mirror rather than a, a window. Mark, why don't you comment on the respondent to this, your second lecture, Kirk Farney, who is a vice president at Wheaton College, but who was your student. Isn't that right? Right. I asked uh, Kirk Farney to comment on the second lecture because his doctoral work, now published as a book from University Press, dealt with two of the most popular radio broadcasters Mm. of the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, Walter Meyer of the Lutheran Hour, and then Bishop, or eventually Bishop Fulton Sheen of the Catholic Hour. His work on those two individuals is really first rate because he shows the different ways in which radio could communicate a really serious Christian message Mm. at a time of Jack Benny and Amos and Andy Mm. and, and, and the Lone Ranger and other things that were highly entertaining, but not particularly heavy in the intellectual side. And what uh, Kirk was able to show in, in the comment on, on the lectures is that uh, Lewis's capacity to s- simplify and yet to make stronger appeals for the Christian faith through radio mm-hmm. was a really important development from the mm-hmm. 1930s and 1940s. Radio in the United States begins in the early 1920s. By the 1930s, it, it's, it's everywhere, but it's, it's still... Um, it's, it's still in a process of formation. There were, there were already a lot of religious broadcasting. Some was serious, some was not so serious. The people he studied, Sheen and Meyer, were serious and communicated a very strong uh, Christian message. And he was able to, to uh, talk about the radio as, as a crucial matter. And it was the radio, I think, and you, you people are the Lewis scholars, you do could uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the radio, I think, that really helped Lewis to see the need for presenting a direct, straightforward, clear Christian message without the footnotes, without the uh, 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 intellectual uh, material that mm. theologians right. would the normally use. scholarly apparatus. There's a really good book by George Marsden on the Mere Christianity talks, the broadcast talks, and he says he'd actually... The previous summer, he'd been going to all these RAF bases, mm. speaking to the RAF personnel. He, Lewis. He, Lewis. Yep. And he really started speaking over their heads at the beginning. Right, right. And he started discovering when they heard the word creature, they thought it meant animal <laughs> uh, <laughs> rather than created being. And when they heard the word authority, these are a bunch of military people. That, yeah. that had negative connotations. Yeah, I want to experience it myself. I'm not going to take it on authority. And Lewis says, well, I believe in New York City on authority. I've never been there. I haven't experienced it. So he kind of learned a lot from speaking to these RAF personnel that he was able to apply to the, the broadcast talks. Mm-hmm. I uh, very much enjoyed George's book and was glad actually to have that appear before I, I tried to do what I tried to do. And it, it clearly was the case that the, that experience by Lewis to try to be out in the field talking to people without an education mm-hmm. just did wonders for what came later in the broadcast talks, the pamphlets, and eventually mere Christianity. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Can uh, can we to maybe talk about the third chapter yes. and the Protestants and in specific, uh, Doctor Noah? I was wondering if you could comment on the the critique, the you know mixed reception by Westminster Presbyterians. I found your uh, section on 
Clowney and Van Til, and then, uh, you know, you kind of connect it to some of Dr. Kilby's work there. I thought that was very fascinating, if you could maybe comment on that. Right, right. In general, what we today call the evangelical um, Protestant world uh, was late in appreciating, late in talking about Lewis in any sense, and, and certainly late in appreciating Lewis. It's not until we get to 1944, 1945, that his magazine of InterVarsity mm. is beginning to feature Lewis positively. Actually, one of the first periodicals in the U.S. to actually excerpt and run, run some of, of Lewis. But the one exception to um, evangelical disinterest in Lewis or uninterest in Lewis were, were conservative Presbyterians associated with Westminster Theological Seminary. And reading uh, those fairly lengthy uh, review articles from the early 1940s, mid-1940s is a, a real treat. The, the people who are writing in general are just really pleased that someone presenting a crisply articulated, basic, mere Christianity is getting the kind of hearing that Lewis is getting. But as with the few Catholics who are nervous about Lewis not emphasizing the church, these conservative Presbyterians are nervous because of the stress that Lewis's pla Lewis placed on the universal instinct of moral um, uh, objectivity. Yeah. To get into the weeds of... 20th century Christian apologetics, most of the Westminster people had uh, bought into the approach of Cornelius Van Til presuppositionalism, which articulates a position on communicating the Christian faith, which says people must begin with an absolute trust in the God of the Bible if they're going to find the Christ of scriptures. And of course, Lewis was coming at it differently. He, of course, began with a universal moral instinct from which then he developed the specifics of, of Christian faith. Yes. I thought it was particularly intriguing in this period of standoff between Catholics and Protestants that one of the things that the Catholic reviewers appreciated most, <laughs> yes. that, that universal moral instinct, was the, th was the one thing that kept the uh, conservative Presbyterians from being wholeheartedly enthusiastic mm. about C.S. Lewis. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, he had such a background in classical writers like Plato and Aristotle right, right, and others. Right. That I think he was aware how many, how often they anticipated Christian beliefs. Yeah. I think sometimes people dismiss the idea that um, you have no natural moral instincts. Uh, they don't, they haven't read enough pagans to realize yeah. uh, how much moral theology yeah. there is in the right. classics. Well, and, we and Lewis to the Bible. is coming from that, you know, largely romantic tradition where you know there's a revelation from nature that's that's more right. important. And obviously, right. the Catholics are going to resonate with that more than the. Uh, Presbyterian, so that makes mm. sense. I like how you did mention Elizabeth Howard, who became Elizabeth Elliot. I still remember one of the transformative books in my life was No Grave and Image mm -hmm. by Elizabeth Elliot, because that, that's one of the first things that challenged the fundamentalism mm -hmm. I grew up in, and the sensitivity to the culture in which a group is embedded when you are ministering to them. And I also like it because my mother was a student at Wheaton College mm -hmm. while Elizabeth Howard was there. She was older. But what I appreciate, too, Mark, is how you did foreground these women, as well as there was a woman that was in the Roman Catholic section. And, and, and Fremantle. Right. Yeah, and Fremantle. And she reminded me when you described her a lot of Joy Davidman, mm -hmm. who Lewis married, because mm -hmm. she as well was someone who was involved mm -hmm. with leftist politics mm -hmm. and then became a Christian, just as Joy Davidman mm -hmm. did. So thank you for that allusion to these important women. I like how you wrapped up the book and, and the third section with your description of Lewis as deeply learned, theologically right. focused, and unusually right. creative. Yes. Can you talk about that for a little bit? I, I thought it was fascinating because the way you articulated it made me realize, oh, that's part of the reason why we haven't had another C.S. Lewis. Because mm. you could look at a specific individual, an apologist or a writer, um, somebody in the Christian consciousness and mm. say, oh, they were deeply learned or they were theologically focused or maybe they were unusually creative. But the combination of right. the three in him as just a powerful communicator, I think is something that uh, we just we just have, you know, it's very rare. And uh, I thought that was very fascinating. If, 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 you, if you want to comment on that. Sure. I, I do, do think it was rare. Um, a difficulty for, for those who have been influenced by Lewis or really appreciated work sometimes is that we think um, the way to have the impact that C.S. Lewis had would be to imitate 
what C.S. Lewis wrote. My own sense is the imitation needs to be on the level that you were talking about. Deeply learned, not necessarily deeply learned in Romantic literature, the Middle Ages, but deeply learned somehow, and then clear thinking, and then creative in, in using that, um, that learning, and then with the, the focus. And my own sense is that if uh, people today, believers today, were able to do that, the product might not look anything at all like what C.S. Lewis mm. wrote, mm. except that it might have a broader impact. Although, as Crystal has mentioned, and as is very clear with even a preliminary understanding of the period we're talking about, things have changed a great deal. Yeah. And, and what was able to communicate broadly and deeply in the 1940s with the World War, with the search for moral absolutes, may not communicate in the same way today. But understanding the qualities that were brought to bear. I also think that Lewis's attitude to his own work was, was really important because we all know people who are bright and intelligent and even brilliant and will be pleased to tell you. That, 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 <laughs> uh, whereas, whereas Lewis's attitude, I think, was he knew he was smart. And he, he knew he had something to say, but he also knew that he was in danger of thinking too highly of himself. So I, I was actually pleased to end the, end the book with the, mm. the poem that he wrote to his, his spiritual mm. Mm, director. director um, um, and I, Father and I, Adams. This was to the, to the nun. Oh, oh, to, to, Sister to the, Penelope? Sister Penelope. Right. Yes. About the, the apologist danger and, and how uh, the person who's speaking up for the Christian faith is in the greatest danger when other people think you've done a good job, yeah, because yeah. that that then is mm -hmm. is is bringing the the foolishness of thinking that the presenter, the apologist, is somehow godlike in the ability to, to make the apology. And uh, Lewis, I think, could could stand up to criticism, but part part of the preparation for the uh, the lectures was, was to read a lot of the Lewis correspondence that Walter Hooper has has, has put together, and I, I was just really impressed that he he would respond to critics and, and he would. Uh, tell people who, who were uh, taking uh, shots at his work why he thought they were incorrect, but he, but he didn't, didn't seem to do this defensively. Yeah. And he, mm -hmm. he realized that, um, you know, sometimes when people make criticisms of your work, it's deser deserving. So it was a very positive attitude toward his own work as well as then yeah. exhibiting mm -hmm. the kind of characteristics you mentioned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why don't you give us a, a bit summary about Amy Black's response to your third lecture. Yes. Uh, Amy Black is a uh, fine political scientist at uh, Wheaton, and she was able to talk about co the contemporary situation of Christian faith in the world at large in, in the academy as a kind of uh, counterpoint to what I was talking about with Lewis in the 1930s and 1940s. And I thought it was really uh, uh, important to have her as on the current Wheaton faculty, speaking about the way I ended the book with, again, the, the discussion of the general, the general characteristics uh, uh, that Lewis brought to, to bear on these works and then how they were treated in, in the press. She was able to talk about some of the same kind of efforts in the uh, early uh, tw 21st century, but then the different uh, circumstances, the, the greater polarization, for example, of the public sphere that, that, uh, that makes it unusual for the uh, Los Angeles Times, the Chicago yeah. Tribune, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Atlantic Journal, New to, York to, Times, to, to, to have glowing articles about something that's distinctly uh, Christian. Yeah. So it was mm -hmm. a really nice. Actually, all three presenters, uh, all three commentators, I thought did a really nice job connecting to what I had said, but then uh, relying on their own expertise to show mm. uh, the relevance and some some aspect of mm. what was what was in Lewis's right. yeah. work. Right. Um, you've mentioned, uh, David, you mentioned earlier the Marsden book, and I know there are a number of other um, books and historians have done research on the reception of Lewis. Um, what what did you learn that was maybe new, uh, especially, you know, you, you, you yourself knowing so much history and working on it for this conference back in 2012 or 13? What, what did you learn that was new? Um, what new knowledge do you think that we've gained from, from this researcher and, and that we could maybe apply to Lewis as we engage with him now? Well, yes, I certainly uh, benefited not only from George Marsden's biography of mere Christianity, but uh, K. Allen Snyder has a very fine book on the reception of Lewis. Stephanie Derrick wrote a dissertation in Scotland, actually, that then became a really nice book on uh, British and American, but mostly British reception of, of Lewis. I need to just pause and say Stephanie's book is really uh, impressive for answering the question why, in general, 
of American audience has been more enthusiastic about Lewis than English, British, British audience. Yeah. And it, it's a very fine study. My own, my own sense is, is that the, um, the different constituencies that sort of uh, uh, showed themselves when, when we were doing this research give us uh, different angles on how Christian faith can be presented in a creative and literary way today. So amongst Catholic reviewers were learned people and certainly underscored the value of a Christian spokesperson who was learned himself and, and could express the learning with real creativity. The general public was, was uh, impressed by Lewis's skill at communication and the, the crispness with which he presented what he presented. The Protestant uh, world, I think, w- was uh, helped mainline Protestants by seeing a, an Orthodox voice who uh, w- was really uh, trying to keep the main stream of Protestantism from moving into uh, Christian modernism. And then the more conservative angle, the evangelicals and fundamentalists, saw that it wasn't, wasn't really a problem if you were learned. It wasn't really a problem if you were creative. <laughs> it wasn't really a problem if you didn't emphasize mm-hmm. the particulars of your individual group. But somebody saying something creatively about the basic structure of Christianity was a really good thing. Mm. Uh, I, I still am a little nervous still about the, the uh, enthusiasm of evangelicals after the period I'm, I'm working on. Mm. Uh, oh, oh, not because the enthusiasm is, is misplaced in itself, but that it makes uh, Lewis a kind of icon to be imitated in what he did mm. rather than an icon to be imitated in how he went about Mm. what he did. But, That's but, a nice right. distinction. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. But, but the, uh, the, the, the fun of working at the book was someone who's not a Lewis scholar really really trying to get back into the 30s and 40s and seeing how the reactions and reception cast a real strong light on how that period was developing. Mm. Alison McGrath says that it's amazing that Lewis, not only that he was so famous, but that he continues to be so famous. Mm. He sells more books now than he did in his lifetime. Mm. If you go to HarperCollins website, they have categories like history and biography. Under uh, spirituality, they have spirituality slash C.S. Lewis. Mm. Oh, wow. So he's, he's holding at down the whole domain <laughs> of spirituality. <laughs> uh, so it is fascinating that even as mainstream culture in America seems to get further away from uh, Christian foundations, someone like Lewis is continuing yeah. to be mm. so influential. Mm. This is a very important mm-hmm. book. And Mark, you did a fantastic job just in your research and Maggie in contributing to your research and the, the respondents you chose. And I want to tell our listeners that we, if they write the Wade, wade at wheaton.edu, um, we will supply a 20% discount for them of this book with Mark Knoll's signature in it. And for anybody who wants to understand the context in which C.S. Lewis was writing and speaking to others, and anybody who wants to understand tensions among different Christian groups. This is a great way to learn because it has the thread of C.S. Lewis tying everything together. Thank you so much for writing it and for being with us today. Yeah, certainly my pleasure, and thank you for the attention to the book. Great. great. Thank you. The Wade Center Podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to The Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, past collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about the Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.